as the Tutsi in 1994. Tonight, joining us are some Holocaust survivors, uh, and we are sending a warm welcome to the Holocaust survivors that are joining us. It is a great honor to uh, partner for the first time with Evo, the Institute of Jewish Research in New York. And you will hear all about Evo, if you don't know much about it, from our first presenter, Jonathan Brent, the CEO of Evo. Let me introduce to you our three presenters and let you know about the order of the webinar tonight. First, as I said, Jonathan Brent will open uh, with an opening remarks about Evo and about this exciting exhibition and in general, the collections uh, at, the, uh, at the Institute. Jonathan Brent is a historian, publisher, translator, writer, and teacher. At Yale University Press, he established the Annals of Commun Communism series. His books include Stalin's Last Crime and Inside Stalin's Archives, both in 2003 and 2008. In 2009, Brent became executive director and CEO of the Evo Institute for Jewish Research, where he initiated the Evo Vilna Collection Project in 2014. In 2019, Brent received the Cross of the Night of the Order for Merits to Lithuania by His Excellency Dalia Gribowskaite, President of the Republic of Lithuania. Brent lectures and publishes widely on Jewish, Soviet, and East European history and teaches at Bard College. It is wonderful to welcome you, Jonathan, and Jonathan will be the first speaker tonight. After that, let me introduce to you Karolina Zulkowski. Karolina is a new media artist and designer and is currently the chief curator of the Ivo Bruce and Francesca Cernia Sloven Online Museum that we will hear all about tonight. Before that, she developed interactive exhibitions for the American Museum of Natural History. She is a principal creator of DEMO, a self-governed crowdsourcing marketplace, a project of the Stanford Crowd Research Collective, and served as an adjacent professor at Rutgers University Visual Arts Design Program. Uh, Ms. Zolkowski is the recipient of numerous awards, including an InnoVeps award from the Brazilian Ministry of Communications, a Communications Art Interactive Award, the 2017 shortlist for the Fashion and Beauty Clio Awards, and recognition as a professional notable at the Core 77 Awards. And uh, you are in for an amazing, amazing uh, look at this new, I would say, award-winning, uh, future award-winning um, exhibition that Carolina was so heavily involved in. L after Carolina, we will welcome Michael Leventhal. And here we are so honored to have actually the son of Beba Epstein that the exhibition is all about. Michael Leventhal specializes in providing corporate, intellectual property, and business trans transactional services for media, entertainment, and technology companies, as well as general businesses. Michael has been a partner in a large national firm, a co-owner of several boutique law firms, and a business consultancy, a solo practitioner, and a senior executive at a high-flying technology company. Most recently, Michael served as chief legal office and vice president at Magic Leap Incorporated, the well-known augmented mixed reality venture. He's a frequent speaker and a writer on XR, tech and startups, but tonight he will not speak about law or about startup or augmented reality. He will just speak about his mother, Beba. So it is absolutely wonderful to welcome Jonathan, Carolina, and Michael, the floor is yours.
and you will have to unmute yourself, Jonathan. Ah, okay, very good. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor to be making uh, contact with the South African Jewish community through this event. We have wanted for years and years to do so. And I am most grateful for this opportunity that has been given to us by the Johannesburg Genocide and Holocaust Center. Evo was started in 1925 in Berlin, in Warsaw, and in Vilnius. Today Vilnius, then Vilna. The purpose of this institute was to become the first academy of higher learning of the Jewish people of Eastern Europe. What did that mean? It meant studying our history, studying our folklore, studying our language, languages, studying our theater, studying our literature, studying our political associations, studying the, 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 the social organizations that bound our people together for nearly a thousand years in Eastern Europe. Soon, however, after in its initial founding in 1925, Evo became more than just an institution like a college or a university. Evo became a mass movement and people all around the world, Jewish people all around the world of Ashkenazi descent began to send their materials to Vilna where Max Weinreich was the director um, and initiated the first collection campaign. Because how do you study the people if you don't have the books and the documents and the music and, and all of the artifacts of their lives? And so he sent out a call, send us everything Send us everything. And so uh, people in Chicago, Illinois, sent material to Vilna. New York, Buenos Aires, Moscow, uh, uh, China, Japan, the Middle East. Uh, Yivo's collection uh, has eventually grown to some 25 million documents and artifacts and approximately 400,000 books in various languages. The materials that we have in our archives are in Yiddish, in Polish, in Hebrew, in German, in Russian, in uh, Arabic, in uh, Romanian, in Lithuanian, uh, in Chinese, in Japanese, all the languages of the world and everywhere that the Jewish people from Eastern Europe went and made their lives. And so Ivo became a center uh, of, of great learning and a repository, a very precious repository of this, of this history, of this historical memory. In 1941, when the war broke out in the Soviet zone and the Nazis uh, invaded, Yivo was seized by the Nazis. Uh, and uh, instead of destroying everything, recognizing the great treasure that now had fallen into their hands, the Nazis decided to send a great deal of material to Germany, to Frankfurt, where it would be studied. They destroyed a great deal. And at the same time, a group of very heroic uh, men and women, Jewish men and women of the ghetto, who had been enlisted by the Nazis to sort this material because it quickly became apparent that the Nazis couldn't read these documents. They decided that in addition to sending material to Frankfurt, that they would hide material in the Vilna ghetto. And indeed, 
something like uh, close to a half a million documents and thousands of books were eventually hidden in the ghetto. So the YIVO archive was divided into two, part of it in Frankfurt, part of it in Vilna. After the war, the US Army found in a warehouse outside of Offenbach, Germany, the material that had been stolen by the Nazis. This was sent to New York, where Max Weinreich had reestablished the headquarters of the YIVO Institute, which is a miraculous story in itself. The material that was hidden in the Vilna ghetto was found after the war by those leaders of YIVO who had survived, many of whom had been partisans. They found it, they recollected it, and they were going to make a new museum of the Jewish people. In 1948, the Soviet anti-cosmopolitan, anti-Jewish anti campaign got started and the order was given to destroy everything that had been saved. At that point, Jewish leadership fled because they were informed they would be shot. And all of this material was going to be destroyed, pulped. But a Lithuanian librarian, the head of the National Lithuanian, the Lithuanian National Book Center that uh, was located in the Church of St. George that had been converted by the Soviets into the book chamber. He made the decision, a very heroic one, that this could not be. And with colleagues, he retrieved the material and brought it back to the church, brought it to the church. And there he hid it in various places and at the same time sent material to other institutions for safekeeping. Antanas Ulpis died in 1981 and he never knew what became of all of this material that he saved. But in 1989 and then again in 1991 with the collapse of the Soviet Union, Lithuanian officials began cleaning out the church and they discovered this massive amount of Jewish material. Now, it meant that there was material in the Soviet Union and there was material in New York City. What makes this particularly different from other Jewish materials of World War II is that the Lithuanians did not seize the material. They did not steal it, they saved it. And so for many years, there were discussions as to what to do with this material. When I became a director of EVO in 2009 and partly owing to my um, work in the Soviet archives, I realized that it might be possible to recreate as much of the original archive as possible digitally and uh, thereby create an integrated uh, and coherent uh, collection. And so in 2014, I began to approach Lithuanian authorities. In 2015, the project got underway and uh, the uh, Edward Blank Yivo Vilna Collections project got started to digitize approximately a million and a half documents and approximately 12,000 books. The project will be finished in December uh, 2021. Now, when we saw all of these documents going online so that somebody in South Africa and somebody in Moscow and somebody in New York could all be looking at the same document at the same time, it became abundantly clear to me that unless that person knew how to read 19th century Yiddish handwriting or Hebrew or Polish or pre-revolutionary Russian, 
the documents are just pieces of paper. And the story that we want to tell through these materials remains untold. And so at that point, the idea of creating the museum was born. It was born out of a desire and really the obligation that Ivo feels and the obligation that has been our mission for almost a hundred years to share these riches with the whole of the Jewish world. This is our legacy. This is our inheritance. This is the precious treasure that has been saved that helps us understand not just what history was, what, what happened back then, but it helps us understand who we are, how we got to be who we are, what were the struggles, what were the ambitions, what were the aspirations, what were the difficulties, what were the pleasures of our life for almost a thousand years in Eastern Europe. And so our great treasure consists of communal records. It consists of religious texts, educational records, medical records. It consists of memoirs, autobiographies, um, uh, literature, poetry, art, music, sound recordings, folklore, uh, costumes. Uh, the YIVO Institute is a never ending wonderment uh, to me. There is hardly a day that goes by without my discovering things I could not believe were there. Letters of Thomas Mann, for instance, letters of Tolstoy, in addition to the archive of Chaim Grada and many other great uh, 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 Jewish writers. So how are we going to do this? You can't just translate one and a half million documents. That would be first never ending and second, it would be too expensive. And third, even if you did and you put them up in the internet in English, people would still lack context they still wouldn't understand what the meaning of those documents was. And so the idea grew to, uh, 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 the, the shape of the idea grew to, we will make galleries organized by themes, organized by individuals, organized by events that will create narratives. And through these narratives, we will be able to explain the meaning of these documents. And so that was really the, um, the birth of this idea. I should say, since, uh, since uh, this is the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center, that YIVO has over 7 million original documents pertaining to the Holocaust. And uh, this is also one of the extraordinary treasures in the YIVO Institute. Now, all of this could not have been done without the active participation. It's one thing to have an idea, but as my dissertation advisor once said to me, ideas are a dime a dozen. You have to implement these ideas. You have to make them real. And so I went to Vilnius and I started meeting people and uh, the, the support that this idea received from the Lithuanian government was consistent and it was enthusiastic. But at the very beginning of eliciting that support, I became acquainted with Fajina Kuklianski, the head of the Lithuanian Jewish community. And she drove me all around Vilnius uh, to archives, to the library meeting, so and so and so and so and so and so. And I, and I said to uh, Faina, I said, Faina, why are you doing all of this for me? She looked at me as though I were an idiot. And she said, I am not doing it for you. I am doing it for me. And I think that's the secret of this project, why it has uh, been successful both in Lithuania as well as in the United States. 
We are all doing it for ourselves. Why? Because it shows us who we are. It opens up a history that has been closed. And in some strange way, it makes a future of dialogue and openness more possible for all of us. So I will say no more about YIVO, but we'll be happy to answer questions as they come up. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And please do post your questions in the chat or comments or thoughts as we go along. Carolina. So hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you to the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center and its executive director, Tally Nates, for generously organizing this event. Um, I'm going to focus more on the museum, the exhibition itself, now that Jonathan has spoken about the story of Yivo. So the purpose of the museum is to tell the story of Jewish life in Eastern Europe and Russia. And the way we do this is by following the life of a person. Our first exhibition, as you know, focuses on the life of Beba Epstein, a young Jewish woman who was born in 1922 in Vilna, went through the Holocaust, and was the only person in her family that survived. So the basis for this exhibition is her autobiography written when she was around 11 years old and found in 2017 in Vilnius, Lithuania. And this is part of the documents that were hidden by Antonis Opis um, at the church's basement. And from the autobiography, we expanded into her whole life. So the idea is that by following a person's life, you can learn about many different topics. It creates empathy. And when you care about knowing more regarding that person, it can connect you to all that was happening around them. It serves as a type of springboard to create interest for history. And history itself, culture, economy, government policies, none of it happens in a vacuum. All of them have concrete influence and consequences over people's lives. And yet we learn about everything separately. So what we worked towards here was to always make the connection between her life and the historical context around her and how they influenced and had very real consequences in her life. So before I dig into the exhibition itself, I wanna talk a little bit of why we chose Beba's story for this first exhibition. So Beba's life was chosen because it was not unlike that of many children today. She loved her family, she went to school, she had summer holidays in resort towns, went to summer camps, wanted to go to college someday. And yet, because of prejudice, her entire life as she knew it was destroyed. And by choosing a life that is similar to that of many children today, irrespective of faith or background, we can show that hate is uncalled for and will continue to happen unless we stand up against it. So I'm going to start with a tour uh, so you can see how it works. I'm going to share my screen here. All right, so I hope everyone is able to see it. Um, so the storyline of the exhibition is divided into chapters and each chapter focuses on a specific topic. You can follow the whole story from beginning to end or explore individual chapters. All of them are full stories in themselves. So this here is a table of contents that shows everything we have available. We focus on her life before, during, and after the Holocaust. After all, the Holocaust wasn't all there was to Jewish life in Europe at the time. It's actually a very rich society, as you can see in the first six chapters. We talk about her summer holidays, summer camps, what she learned at school, the city she lived in. And uh, each chapter contains several layers of information that enable you to explore the content in greater depth. So here I'm gonna open into chapter two. Um, in this chapter, Beba presents her family, and we use this as an opportunity to talk about all the changes that were happening between the mid-1800s and early 1900s in Jewish communities. So the main content of each chapter is Beba's story as told by her. In here, we adapted into animations Beba's account of her grandparents, parents, and siblings, all taken directly from her autobiography. So on the left side here, we always have a timeline that shows main historical events that were happening at the time to tie her story into the bigger historical context. Then we have below each animation, uh, these that we call historical context boxes. They offer further information about the historical context of the time. So in the animations to mention topics that might not be known by everyone. So we explain those here in a bit more detail. And from here, whenever possible, we also connect to resources to learn even more deeply about a subject. 
uh, some of the links will take you to the EVA Encyclopedia, which is the most complete resource about history and culture of Jews in Eastern Europe from the beginnings of their settlement in the region to the present. I had waves on the back. And I... <laughs> uh, so if someone is interested in a specific topic, here they can learn in greater depth about it. So the idea of this is to mimic um, that structure of that rabbit hole that we have all fallen into online sometime where we go deeper and deeper and deeper into a subject. But here we have everything coming from trusted sources. And finally, in each chapter, we offer a selection of artifacts, which are documents, videos, photographs, objects, songs and audio recordings um, that expand the main topic of that specific chapter. Some relate directly to Baba's story, like family letters and other personal documents that we used in research, while others deal with the general topic. So for example, in this chapter, Beba talks a lot about uh, life for Jews in the Pale Settlement. And in one of the animations, she says how marveled she was that her grandfather was able to travel around and how her grandmother really wanted to visit other places but was never able to. So in the context box, we expand a little bit more into travel restrictions for Jews in the Pale of Settlement. And then here in the artifacts, we feature, for example, um, a passport permitting travel outside the Pale of Settlement for a Jew. Uh, and this was from 19, uh, 1898. Um, and also, we always have a scholar text uh, that expands further the topic of each chapter. And finally, whenever relevant, we have a set of maps to situate where you were uh, in that specific chapter. And this is uh, especially relevant in this exhibition because of all the border changes that happened in the span of the story. So as you can see, each chapter is very rich in content and you can explore the exhibition at your own pace. So some chapters, you'll see that some chapters are more interactive, some more passive, some shorter, some longer. And each feature was chosen based on what would be the best way to showcase content while still keeping you, the audience, engaged. Um, and as a note, we always display more or less how long it takes to complete each chapter below the exhibition of each one of them. So now I'm going to show you some highlights of the exhibition, including both experiences and some individual artifacts. Uh, so we're going to start here in chapter one. So here we present Beba, and uh, the content here was adapted from her autobiography and transformed in scroll animations. Here you'll learn a little bit more about her personality. And uh, in this chapter, in one of the artifacts, we featured the autobiography of uh, Beba Epstein. So we have the full original in Yiddish. Um, we have images and also a PDF, and we also have a full English translation of it. And I really, highly recommend you read all of it because it's a very fascinating account. Uh, moving forward, I wanna jump now to chapter four. So chapter four focuses on schools and education uh, in Eastern Europe. So we start with a dialogue between Beba's grandfather and a bookstore worker. In her autobiography, Beba says that her grandfather always bought books for kids who couldn't afford, so they could uh, just go to the bookstore and pick up them and study. He valued education and wanted everyone to have access to it. So then you can go ahead and choose your notebook and have a look at several uh, different schools that Jewish, Jewish children could attend at the time. So in this one here, this is a notebook from uh, the Tsisho School uh, in Poland that we have in our collections. You always find a scan and also a summary of the content in there. Um, and you have a little glimpse at uh, the curriculum, what kids were learning, how is that uh, similar or different to today. Uh, Beba herself went to the Sofia Gorevich School, which um, we happen to have the remnants of the school's archive in our collections. And we did here a selection for a more um, interactive notebook to see what Beba would be learning in school at the time. Um, and now let me jump here to chapter five. So chapter five focuses on Vilna in the 1930s. We have a selection of eight parts of the city to explore in 3D reconstructions. Some of them are about the city itself and some are more personal and revolve around Beba's personal experience. So her schools, her house, et cetera. Um, so let me open up one of the places in here. And this is the great synagogue area in Vilna, which we reconstructed in 3D. 3D. 
So when you click in these dots here, um, you have access to photographs and texts talking a little bit more about the places or people that we are highlighting in each of the experiences. So here you have the library and this is the great synagogue, which unfortunately are no longer standing. Um, and then this one here, we also feature the Vionagon study house, um, which uh, was right at the, the great synagogue's uh, Schulhof. And uh, from here, we also have pictures and we also connect to the Vionagon Pinkas book, which is one of the most important holdings in Evo's collection. Um, another 3D experience that we feature is the market hall, which is still standing in Vilnius today. And this here is little Beba, and she's waiting you to buy ingredients to bake. So when you click here, we offer some pictures. Um, this is from 1929. Um, and this is another uh, picture of a busy market uh, that was an outside market next to the main building. And here we have um, a recipe for hamantashen for you to uh, bake it with Beba. And this is from one of Evo's China Online uh, classes. And this is something that we try to do in the museum a lot, which is always connect to a lot of the other things that uh, Evo does. We have several events, classes, et cetera. And um, this is a way for you to start exploring the Evo world. Uh, so then if you get here, we also made, this is a reconstruction of the outside market, for example. Uh, so there is, um, a lot to explore, a lot of places in the city to visit, uh, just in this chapter alone. Um, and coming back here to the main page of uh, this experience, we also feature several artifacts about uh, the city of Vilna, which was a very important center for the Jewish community in Europe. Um, so for example, we have, this is a drawing of Jet Cover Street. Uh, this is a poster for a, for a Yiddish theater presentation. This is a picture of a scene from their D book um, from a theater troupe presenting it. Um, and we have a little bit of everything, even uh, notice of theft of cows from a home. Um, and then one very interesting one that I'm going to play a little clip for you here. This is a video clip from 1929, which shows a little bit of the old Jewish quarter in Vilna. We have several video clips throughout the exhibition where you can get a, a glimpse of life um, at the time. Um, so then from here, I am going to show you a little bit of chapter seven. So chapter seven focuses on the world context leading up to the war. Um, it's also a 3D experience where you can select one of many, general, many places around the world. And we talk a little bit about the economy and um, immigration practices that were happening at the time. Uh, it's unfortunate that a lot of what's going, what's going on in the world right now is very similar. So the world, uh, the world right now, so the world was going through a great depression. And as a result of that, um, everyone around the world was closing their borders to immigration, especially Jewish immigration. One of the countries we feature is South Africa. And here we talk a little bit about the economy and restrictions imposed on Jewish immigration in the 1930s. Um, we try to go a little bit all over, so you're free to explore more later. Um, so then from here, we go into the uh, chapter regarding the Holocaust and Baba's experience in the Holocaust itself. Uh, so this chapter is based more on texts, documents, and testimonials, and is divided into four parts. And whenever a relevant historic aspect is presented by Beba, because the main account is through her words, um, we expand into the historical context in the boxes. So for example, we start with the occupation of Vilna by the Soviets in September, 1939, following the uh, Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact. So here we talk, we use this box to talk a little bit more about what set off the war and uh, this pact that was done a little bit before the invasion, the German invasion. Um, and soon later, the Soviets transferred Vilna to Lithuania, and Beba mentions how they had to now speak Lithuanian in school and how the city was renamed Vilnius and everything changed. However, at this point, life moved on in the city um, and they thought that things would be all right. And we even found in our archives a family letter where it's mentioned that Beba was planning a trip to Minsk in the summer of 1940. So 
from here, we go into the second part. And this is about the German invasion of Vilnius, which happened the day after Beba's high school graduation. The ghetto is established, and she's sent to hide with a family outside the ghetto. Letters are sent back and forth, and at some point, they stop. And Beba goes back into the ghetto, only to discover that her whole family had been murdered. She takes various jobs and stay there until the ghetto is liquidated. Um, and here we always uh, make a selection of archive pictures and objects that are relevant to the story that we are telling. And we also intersperse with some of um, excerpts from Beba's testimonials that she gave to the Los Angeles Holocaust Testimonies Project. Um, she was also part of the Jewish resistance in the Vilna ghetto. Um, and then from here, we go to the third part, which focuses on the many places she sent after. So she uh, is sent to several concentration camps um, and also to a factory that used the labor of Jewish prisoners. And in 1924, she ends up at Stutthof, which I believe renders some resemblance to the experience of some in the South African Jewish community. This is uh, what we believe could be her entry in the Stutthof logbook. logbook. The dates and names are a bit different, but uh, it could be her because there is a lot of similarities. Um, and she stays in Stutthof until the end of the war. She thought she would, she says that she thought she would never survive. Um, she was not part of the death march of Stutthof because she was sick and she was taken into boats in a German attempt to evacuate the camp in May 1945. I'm not going to go through everything because it's a lot, but I suggest you read the whole chapter later. She finally ends up in a hospital in Sweden at the end of the war. And uh, I just want to use this opportunity to make some points as to why her story is very interesting for Holocaust learning specifically. So first of all, she's a girl who goes through this by herself. So it is, although extremely sad and heartbreaking, also empowering. And uh, this is not to say that she didn't receive any help and that she wasn't helped throughout, that she didn't help anyone throughout the way. But uh, there is no savior in her story, which is the experience of the majority of Jews during the war. And she goes through many diverse experiences, as I just um, explained, through the ghetto, hiding, several concentration camps, working in factories. And through her life, one can learn about several experiences Jews went through the war. And uh, it is also very real. There is no romanticizing of heroes or how she survived. A family hid her in their attic, but she knew they were being paid for it. And she did what she had to do to survive. At some point, she and other women beat another Jewish girl because her behavior was potentially dangerous to the Jewish women around them. And they did it to protect themselves. Um, also in this chapter, we have a selection of artifacts pertaining to the war. As Jonathan said, we have a very large um, collection of Holocaust materials, which is the second, um, second only to Yad Vashem. So one of the objects we feature here in this selection, it's this one here, which is a Rosh Hashanah album made by the children of the Yudh ghetto. So they made this album to um, give it to the leader of the Yudhamrat, Runkowski, and around 14,000 children signed it. Of those, we believe only around 2,000 survived the war. And another, um, artifact that we have here in our collections, it's one of the logbooks from Auschwitz. So this is from block eight. And uh, when you see the pages, you see many names crossed out and those mean that these prisoners are murdered by the Nazis, which is the date that they left. Um, and this here um, is a visa that was issued to a family escaping Eastern Europe. So this was issued by Sujihara, which was the Japanese consul in Kaunas, Lithuania. Um, they escaped to Japan via the Soviet Union, and Sujihara is considered one of the heroes of the Holocaust because he acted on his own against orders of his superiors to help over 2,000 mostly Jewish refugees to escape Europe at the time. Um, and then um, we end the, um, the next chapter we are going, going to go through now is chapter 9, where we uh, go through Beba's immigration process to the United States. She was helped by her uncle, Lazar Epstein, her father's brother, who lived in New York. So this chapter here is a detective game. You have to find clues and answer the questions correctly, or you're going to be stuck, just like an actual attempt at immigrating. And in the end of this chapter, let me just select here, we go through what would happen if she tried to immigrate today. 
Long story short, she would most likely not succeed. And this would be true for many other countries, not just the United States. Um, the last chapter, we go through her life um, after the war in the United States, and uh, we go through the beautiful life and family she built. And we close the exhibition with this beautiful poem by Noah Leventhal, who is Michael's son and a poet. And before I finish, I just want to say that we have uh, teacher's guides where we um, give suggestions on how to use the materials. There are guides for grades three to five, six to eight, and nine to 12, with uh, many ways that you can use each of the chapters. So you can pick and choose. Um, if you are in a classroom, you can pick and choose however you want to do this. And um, so there is a lot to be explored. And um, I have to say that when the autobiography was found, we no one at Givo had any idea that she had lived, uh, that she had survived, and even less of an idea that we had so many materials in our archives about her and her family, because we uh, discovered them, that we also happened to have the archives of her uncle, Lazar Epstein, the one who helped her immigrate to the United States. He was a prominent member of the Bund, and uh, his archives were transferred to Yivo from the Bund archives. Um, and we found several family letters, all of her immigration documents, even love letters from her husband to her in, um, in his archives. So there were no preset ideas. The development of the exhibition was a process of discovery. And uh, this was all because a friend of Michael saw the autobiography with Baba's picture in the New York Times and told him, and we learned about her life after the war which is more or less the way that her uncle Lazar found out she was alive after uh, the Holocaust. She sent a letter to a newspaper. Her name was included in a survivor list that was read in the radio in Palestine. And a friend of Lazar heard and sent him a cable. So the point is that the museum is revelatory. It's not stirring around preset ideas. It's not a compilation, it's a revelation. And we hope you access it. It's free, it's available online. And what I showed you is just a little bit of a lot of materials and content and experiences that we have available. You can explore at your own pace, stop and return whenever you like. And we just want as many people as possible to view it and to use Baba's story as the starting point to learn more about the broad historical context. Um, so that's it for now. And if you have any questions, please, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carolina. And will you be so kind as to post in the chat the link to the exhibition? Everyone is very excited. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, I'm sure they will explore it further after the webinar. And now it is a great pleasure to invite Michael, Bebo's son, to tell us about his mom. Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you to the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center for this opportunity to speak to you. And thank you to Evo for almost 100 years of work that has made all of this possible. Uh, my mother always had a strong connection with Evo. My mother, Bebba Leventhal, née Epstein, was a complicated woman. She walked a difficult path for most, if not all, of her life. Some of that difficulty came from the world, some came from her. First and foremost, she was a survivor. Although she lived to be almost 90 years old, anyone who knew her knew that she was ruled by the four years, 1941 to 1945, starting when the Holocaust came to Vilna. She was a witness to one of the darkest periods in the history of humanity and experienced the worst in human behavior. She was never able to escape the memories and it colored her view of the world and of its people. For some reason, she viewed herself as weak, <clears throat> although the facts continually contradicted her. Numerous times after the Nazis came to Vilna in 1941, she beat the odds and survived. From the selections to the inhumanly crowded rail cars, to the work details in Gestapo headquarters, to the death camps, to the barge on the Baltic mined with explosives on which she was placed with bombs dropping all around her, semi-delirious and weighing 73 pounds. She beat the odds again coming to America and finding my father. As I understand it, my sister Mary and I were pregnancies number four and six, the only two who survived. She kept trying and when she kept at something, she was pretty hard to stop. 
just like when she had an opinion. You were going to hear it, whether you wanted to or not. And she had lots of them. In 1966, my mother had breast cancer. She beat the odds again. She survived and thrived. It never came back. This in a community of Holocaust survivors whose ranks started thinning in the 1960s when catastrophic diseases and conditions started to take them. She taught me a lot, uh, the importance of family, the value of knowing one's history, our Jewish culture, all about Vilna, her birthplace, the Jerusalem of Lithuania. She was proud of her family's involvement in one of the great Jewish publishing houses, Rom Publishing. I learned to love reading, married a woman who loves reading, and have raised two children who love reading. Like reading, I inherited a passion for music from both of my parents. My mother loved Chopin the most, although in later years, I think Mozart was gaining. Uh, she was incredibly proud of Yasha Heifetz. He was from Vilna, you know. Mary and I learned the piano as children, and, and that learning, although I did not become the concert pianist or conductor she hoped I would, has informed and enriched my life. Again, that passion for music has been inherited by our children. Those were the things she was able to do. Something much more difficult was for her to be happy. I always believed that she could not allow herself to be happy, that to be truly happy would be a betrayal of all of the, of the family that she lost in the war. So in spite of the wonderful life that she and my father co-created for all of us, she had trouble appreciating it. She was passionate about Judaism, about Vilna, about Yiddish, about her friends, and most of all about us, her family. She loved us all fiercely and you could see it in everything she talked about. Up to her last days, the same questions kept coming. How are you? How is your business? How about Sharon? How is Ariel liking camp? How is her volleyball? How is Noah? Is he getting ready to go to college? Can I read more of his poems? How is his girlfriend? Is she nice? Do you like her? When can I see her again? Her last big wish to me was, sorry. Her last big wish to me was, I want to come to dinner at your house. I regret that we could not make that happen, but I can console myself with the hundreds of times it did. In 2012, I lost both of my parents seven weeks apart. We were a small family on my mother's side because of the Holocaust. No close aunts or uncles, no cousins. When you lose your parents, you realize very quickly that there is no one left to answer questions about family. There's no new information coming. You have to make do with what you have. Ask your parents, everybody on this call, ask your parents all the questions you can think of. So when five years after they both passed, suddenly this autobiography just magically appears out of the past with information about my mother that I never knew it was just incredible, a gift from the universe. We have a few items from my mother's early childhood, photos that came from someone of my mother, my grandparents, my aunt, all when my mother was maybe four years old or younger. After that, there's nothing until after the war when she was at least 23 years old, nothing in between. So to get this glimpse of my mother as an 11 year old, complete with a photo of a girl none of us ever knew, was and continues to be remarkable. And because of the Evo archives, which hold artifacts from my great uncle, uh, who you've heard about, and my mother and from Vilna in the 1930s, my family and I have been able to piece together much more of her life. It's an incredible gift and we are eternally grateful. One strange insight was gained from the autobiography out of many. Uh, I, I loved my mother very much, but she was a hypochondriac. She would constantly attempt to get attention by being ill in some way. My experience with her gave me a low level of tolerance for that sort of thing in other people. Um, but we always gave her a break on it to some extent because we assumed that the Holocaust was to blame. Then I read the last lines of her autobiography. In my house, I am very loved, but I am not understood. Only when I am sick, then I am a privileged person. And I realized, oh my God, <laughs> she was always that girl. 
it wasn't really the war. This was just who she was. I'm so proud that my mother's life story is, is out there now for people to see. It's remarkably well-written and insightful for an 11-year-old. And I, I know I'm biased, but I think if you read it, you will, you will come to the same conclusion. I'm especially pleased for her that she can be your guide to the Vilna that she loved so much. I've been asked a number of times what I would like people to take from this exhibit. Aside from a, a glimpse into, uh, from, into an important culture that no longer exists, I hope people who experience the exhibit will internalize at least two important messages. One, as you tour the exhibit, lurking in the background is a, de is a depiction of what creeping fascism looks like. It is horrifying in retrospect, but even more importantly, where I live in the United States and throughout the world, we are seeing a return to the ultra-nationalism and xenophobia that precedes fascist states. It is incredibly important that we have the skills to recognize things that are happening while they are taking place and not just in retrospect. The second lesson we can all learn from this exhibit is, and, and the Evo archives is the cost of closed door immigration policies. My understanding is that somewhere in the Evo archives, there is a letter from my grandfather to a brother somewhere in America in the mid 1930s, recognizing the rising danger and asking for help in getting to America. There was no response. Because of the US immigration policy toward Jews and Eastern Europeans at the time, they did not leave were caught up in the maelstrom of World War II, and with the exception of my mother, all perished. Even after the war, and, and this you can see in the exhibit, my great uncle Lazar had great difficulty getting my mother into America. When the nations of the world close their doors to the afflicted, suffering is the result, sometimes on a mass scale. Again, we are seeing this in my home country of the US, it is my hope that through this exhibit, people will learn these lessons and we can begin to open our minds and doors. Finally, as a proud father, and, and uh, Carolina kindly uh, flagged this, and I wanna flag again, on the last page of the exhibit, my, mother, my, my son Noah, who is completing his master's degree in poetry, something my mother loved deeply, has written a beautiful contemplation on my mother, the meaning of history and time. Uh, it makes me cry every time I read it, not that that seems to be that difficult anyway, but do not miss it. Uh, it is a beautiful piece, and that's really what I want to say, so thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michael. You're very, very moving. Uh, is, a, is another second generation daughter of, uh, of survivors. Uh, you, you very much touched my heart, and uh, I'm so proud that your mom is now there to teach us all around the world, um, you know, lessons about, about love rather than hate, about acceptance rather than, than rejection. So thank you so much. And, and thank you uh, to, to uh, Jonathan Brand, to Carolina, and to, and to Michael. Uh, and there are many, many questions and many, many comments that are starting to come through and a lot of appreciation and excitement about the exhibition. Um, and maybe just a general question that came a few times. Are you planning uh, in post COVID world to also have a physical exhibition in New York? Uh, maybe it will travel around the world. What are the plans uh, for the future? Well, personally, I when we were developing this exhibition, I always wanted to be able to do an in-person exhibition as well to follow up with the launch of the museum. And uh, I don't know, I mean, I have to discuss this with Jonathan, but this is definitely something that I would love to do, uh, to do a physical exhibition with some of the artifacts that we have um, online. Yes, if I could follow up, we would love to do it. Um, but it will take a substantial a gallery to do it. And we don't have that space in New York City. As it is, uh, people from 82, I believe, countries around the world have uh, uh, tuned in to this exhibition. And we could not possibly reach people all over the world uh, in any other way than through digital means. 
Yeah, that's the silver lining, I think, of, of, uh, of uh, the pandemic sort of opened the world in, in strange ways. Um, so so I, I see Faina is with us uh, tonight. Hello, hello, Faina. So nice to see you. Uh, uh, hard to believe you were in Johannesburg a year ago. Um, a, a question that came to me privately, and that is an interesting question. Uh, um, Carolina, you spoke about the borders moving, and, and, and of course, Vilna was a Polish city until, uh, until the war. Did Beba see herself as Polish? Did she see herself as Lithuanian? Uh, oh, that, yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, she was born in a Polish state already, so she was born in 1922. Uh, I'm not sure how she saw herself because this is not something that she speaks about in her autobiography. We do know that she went to school um, in Yiddish and Polish as well. This was a requirement of the Polish state and uh, that she learned Polish history. Um, how much uh, she saw herself as part of the society is unfortunately a question that I can't answer right now. I, I can give you a little bit of insight into that. Um... She really did think that, I, I think she felt that she was Polish. She did not identify as Lithuanian. It was not, it was something that kind of happened to her later on. Uh, but it's really interesting because her father was Russian. He was in the Russian army, um, you, you know, because that was in the late 19th century and the early 20th century before the war. So then suddenly Vilna is Poland, then suddenly Vilna is Lithuanian, is, you know, Soviet and, um, and she never really knew the Lithuanian language, but she spoke Polish and Yiddish. I think, I, I believe that she felt that she was Polish, but, but separate, right? Other, because, because the Jews were, I mean, she was, she was Jewish first and she was, you know, she was Yiddish first and, and Polish second. And also and so, just, yeah, sorry, just adding a little bit, um, in the end of the exhibition, we added a document that was actually Michael that found it um, and forwarded it to us, which is her immigration and naturalization services card when she came to the United States. And uh, in that card, it says uh, citizenship stateless. And uh, this is a document that I find very poignant because after you go through all her story, you see how much she was a part of a community. And then in the end, she was, you know, left over as just a stateless person when that's not true. She was a very active member of her community and very much a part of her city. Yeah, and it seems that Vilna was, you know, part of her, you know, part of her identity rather than the state. So um, her love to, to the city was very, very clear. Um, a really interesting question for you, and I think Jonathan, perhaps you you can answer that as you know about the archive. Uh, it's a question from from a teacher, a high school teacher, Jean Boissa. Um, he's a, a, a he seeks refuge in South Africa from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, that is of course full of uh, terrible suffering and, and atrocities uh, to this day. He's thanking you for the brilliant presentation and he's asking how do we capture, you know, uh, all those stories because of course in the DRC there is such silence by the survivors. So, so he's asking perhaps, can you give an advice uh, or from the hundred years of collections about how do you even start? <laughs> Uh, it's a wonderful question. Um, when Max Weinreich uh, announced that YIVO was going to start, people from, as I said before, all over the world wanted to give material. People of all ages. A very good friend of mine who taught um, literature at Yale University, Benjamin Harshav, was such a zamler, a collector for Max Weinreich in Vilna. He was 11 years old at the time. And his job was to go into the marketplace and collect curses by women for Max Weinreich's dictionary and the study of the Yiddish language. And if the curse wasn't good enough, he would be sent back to improve upon it. My guess is that once you start collecting, it will catch on and people will realize how important this is. 
uh, Michael was talking about the uh, need to ask our parents. Well, my parents didn't talk very much. My grandmother didn't talk very much. I would get one word answers from one of my grandfathers. Uh, but these artifacts speak. Uh, I think one of the most brilliant things that Max Weinreich did was institute an autobiography contest among young people in the early 1930s of which this autobiography of uh, Beba Epstein is a uh, result. Um, I would be delighted to uh, speak with the person who asked this question and and, and perhaps we could uh, talk about some ideas. I will, I will make that connection. I think he will really, mm -hmm. really appreciate it, uh, Jean. Hey, Michael, there is an amazing comment here from Donna Lang. And um, she says, thank you, Michael, beautiful reflections. Uh, Beba was my mother's cousin and one of the only ones to survive from the Senitsky uh, side uh, of our uh, uh, of her family, but uh, Beba and my mother were the same age and both grew up in Vilna. But my mother's family left for Montreal in 1930. She was so thrilled when she learned that Beba had survived. They stayed in touch throughout their lives, even though they lived in opposite coast in the U.S. And I think mm -hmm. that is amazing. I don't know if you want to say something. Just, uh, you know, uh, uh, Donna and uh, my wife and I reconnected when we were in New York um, was last year. Or I, time has no meaning anymore. So, but uh, when we were most recently there, it was really uh, lovely to connect and, uh, and to share memories. It's, uh, you know, it's a gift. Absolutely. Uh, there is a question uh, about the new museum in Vilnius. When is it going to open? Are you involved in any way? Uh, we are not involved. Uh, we will happily support every worthy initiative, but we cannot uh, become involved in the creation of, of uh, institutions in different localities. I think it's a huge mistake uh, and we're not going to do it. But if people would like to consult with us, we're very happy to offer what insight we can. Fantastic. And there is a question here about the artifacts. They are amazing artifacts. Uh, and, uh, and people want to know more. I mean, where, where are they from? Uh, can you see them? Is it the first time that uh, people can see them in this way? So maybe you can speak a little bit about the artifacts. Yeah, so um, some of the artifacts are, uh, a few of them that we have in the exhibition are located in uh, Lithuania. Um, the most prominent is Beba's autobiography, which is in Vilnius. Um, but the majority of the other documents are part of the EVO collections that are in New York City. Um, they are not on public view. Um, they are available for research. Um, not all of them, unfortunately. Some of them are closed for digitization. But um, you're free to explore all, all of them in the exhibition. They are scanned. And we also always offer a summary in English, uh, translation of what is in each of the documents. Uh, and there is over 200 of them in the exhibition. So you're free to explore as much as you like. That's amazing. That makes it so rich and, and, and fantastic. Can you tell us a little bit about how long did it take you to create the exhibition? Um, the difficulties, maybe the challenges, what to include and what not to include? And, um, and maybe, Michael, how did you feel when you saw it for the first time after it was sort of done? So these are the kind of questions coming through. Yeah. So regarding development, it was around a year and five months that we spent working on it. Um, and yeah, there is a lot in the exhibition, uh, a lot of materials. And uh, I feel like, um, yes, it was a challenge because obviously the EVO archives holds more than 23 million artifacts. So obviously this is always um, a difficult task to go through. 
But um, I feel like we were not trying to summarize here because we were trying to show uh, life at its fullest, how it was happening and all the historical context that was going on. And in fact, if you want to go through the entire exhibition from beginning to end, it takes you around three hours. Obviously, you don't need to do this all at once. You can stop and come back. And this is the good thing of having an exhibition online. But uh, we try to put as much as possible to give a full picture of such complex things that were happening at the time. So we go through, you know, the payoff settlement, the Russian Empire, the Russian Revolution, the First World War, the Second World War. There is a lot that goes on in the span of the story. And uh, we think it's important to put everything out there. So if you want to learn more, you're going to learn from a place that has um, information that is vetted, that um, is reviewed by scholars. Uh, so you can make sure that what you read there is going to be um, information that is relevant and not, you know, in the world of internet today, you find so much fake news and you don't know what to believe anymore. So we wanted to make a resource that you can trust. So this was very important and one of the most important parts of the project for sure. Jonathan, before Michael, any anything to add about the process? Well, the hardest part of the process was to get people to believe that we could do it, uh, to get people to believe that it was important to do. Um, uh, and um, uh, this uh, I found to be uh, a somewhat daunting uh, task, but I was aided uh, considerably uh, by uh, putting up a, um, PowerPoint on the back wall of our uh, boardroom uh, of documents. And I asked members of our board how many of them could actually read these documents. And the answer confirmed for me the need of this uh, around the world. Uh, you know, my father spoke Yiddish. My grandparents were fluent in it. I was not. I was not. Um, which means that that whole culture that is reflected in the Yiddish language and in these other languages is just inaccessible. It's remote. You know, uh, if an Italian person wants to find, born in the United States, for instance, wants to find out about what it means to be Italian, he can go to Rome or she can go to Florence, or she can go to the Leaning Tower of, uh, uh, you know. Where do Jews of Eastern European origin go? There is no Rome. It was wiped out. How do we recover who we are? And so uh, that to me was uh, the message I had to uh, get uh, accepted and understood. And so to me, and then of course, raising the money, but that actually proved the easiest part of it. Once the idea, the conception of it, the inception of it uh, took hold. Amazing. Michael, how did you feel? What was the experience for you and your family? You know, it was just the most remarkable thing. It was just, you know, as I said, it just kind of just dropped out of the sky on us. And we really, you know, we'd come to terms with, you know, not really getting to know more things about my mother. Um, and, and the autobiography was just this remarkable document um, that really gave us insight and, and images, you know, pictures of, of the boys who would be my uncles and um, you know, that, and, and, and my grandparents and, you know, photos I had never seen before. And then, uh, you know, what happened next was that in connecting with Evo about this, um, and, and kind of making a, a couple of visits to, uh, to the headquarters where they were, they greeted us so warmly, uh, we, we got to see some amazing artifacts you know my my great uncle's uh, archives are there and in my great uncle's archives 
are things like my sister's birth announcement. There, there's like a postcard that I sent to my great uncle when I was 12 from a vacation. You know, there's all this stuff that, you know, that he had saved. And, you know, and, and as uh, I think Carolina said, the love letters from my father to my mother, they courted, um, you know, uh, virtually as, as we would call it today. Um, for a, for a while before they were married, and uh, so just kind of the having the sudden access to the history of our family, I think it it really affected my sister profoundly, and and uh, and my wife and my kids. Um, um, it's just it's a really cool thing, um, and you know we we got to learn things that we we didn't know it's just it's a gift that that most people i think do not get to experience once their parents pass absolutely it's a legacy really it's a legacy for for years to come for you your well, family you know and, and to kind of repeat myself the the idea that my mother can be your tour guide into the city that she loved so much and can be maybe an ambassador um you know, in, in terms of some really important issues that are that are happening today is, is just, uh, you know, an absolute gift. Fantastic. So, so maybe the last question is about languages, other languages. Are you going, are you planning to, to translate it to other languages? What's the plans, the future of, of this exhibition? And maybe are you planning are there exhibitions? Should we wait and see? Well, we're going to have as many, we have 25 million documents. There are 25 million stories, practically. Uh, there are infinite number of possible exhibitions. And so Carolina can be busy for a long time. Um, you see her now, but when she's done with the museum, she will look completely different. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, we are definitely planning uh, new exhibitions. Uh, the next one, and Carolina can speak of it, is on uh, the, um, uh, the Yiddish um, writer, journalist, educator, but also Russian revolutionary, Chaim Zhitlovsky. Um, uh, coming back to languages, uh, the Lithuanian government is interested in translating it into Lithuanian for use in their schools. Uh, we would love the opportunity to translate it into Polish, into Russian, but in order to do so, uh, we need to know that it will be used, uh, that there are people there who would uh, wish to use it. And this comes back to the educational value of these materials. Uh, which uh, we believe are quite great. It's already being used in schools all over the world, in Australia, in England, in the United States of America, uh, and possibly elsewhere. Uh, but this is a little bit down the road. Uh, we're hoping uh, that the Lithuanian government uh, will want to see it in Lithuanian. Yeah, and um, also the National Library of Lithuania is has translated the autobiography into Lithuanian. Uh, I'm not sure when they are going to publish it, but uh, this is something that is coming. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we are working on the exhibition about Zilovsky, which we hope to have out next year sometime. And um, we it's going to be focusing more on political movements, the Russian Revolution, um, and he was very much a Yiddishist, so he was one of the earliest proponents of Yiddish schools. All the schools that I was talking about in this exhibition, they stem from his thoughts. And we are going to try always to connect the exhibitions whenever possible. So when we were talking to Jilovsky about uh, Yiddish schools, we're going to connect into the schools that we have available in Baba's exhibition, because this is very much a consequence of his, um, of his work. Um, and he was also very much a proponent of uh, agricultural settlements. So we are going to get into that, which is something very exciting as well. And yep. we have quite, quite a few teachers, by the way, uh, here. And one of them is saying we are going definitely to use it in the schools in Johannesburg. So yeah, perfect. Are. And if you have <laughs> any questions or want to uh, learn something 
specific, just please write to us at onlinemuseum at evil.cjh.org. We are very happy to answer your questions. I'm going to leave the uh, email address in the chat. Yes, please, please put it in the chat. And uh, Jonathan, sorry, I cut you. Please, please uh, come in. Jonathan, you wanted to add something? Oh, um, yes. Coming back to Zhitlovsky, people might ask, why are we doing an exhibit on someone who is not very well known? Why did we want to do an exhibit on an unknown 11-year-old girl? The point is that so much of our history is unknown to us. So many of these people, first of all, were, were, were lost uh, because of the Holocaust. But uh, unfortunately, uh, so much of our self-understanding is shaped by Fiddler on the Roof and shaped by one or two uh, authors uh, that we all know, uh, the Dibbuk. Uh, but there was a huge life in our people, a huge, brilliant civilization. And this is what uh, we hope to be able to reflect in all of the exhibits. Yeah, it's so, certainly bringing um, uh, this uh, lost life to, 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 uh, to life and fruition. There are, uh, uh, we are about to finish, but there are two uh, very short questions. One uh, from Henry, Henry Slucky about uh, Sutskove poem about melting the printing plate. Uh, led into bullets, does it refer to Beba's family press? Yes, that is. It's the rum press. It wow, was. that's amazing. Was. Yeah. 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 That, that I, I did not make the connection. Amazing. Wow. Yeah. And for, for those that don't know, uh, I mean, maybe tell, tell those that don't know who uh, Schutzkover was and... Uh, I think that will be quite important. So Carolina or Jonathan? Carolina? All right, you can go ahead, Jonathan. Um, well, it is amazing. And, you know, I guess what I would say is that it's one of hundreds of amazing things that we discover as we go forward with this interconnections. And, you know, I can tell you that as a scholar, I can say that this history has been not sufficiently studied. Oh. Uh, it just has not. Uh, in, in so many different ways, the influence, for instance, of Russian futurism on Sutskever is very little known, very little understood, but it was most definitely there. He spent time in Moscow. He met with the futurist poets. Um, there, this, this, you know, around the kitchen table, far too often we get the sense that the Jewish people uh, lived in uh, poor and blighted circumstances and they were benighted and so on and so forth. We have found treatises on astronomy from the 18th century among the materials of uh, uh, the Vilna collections. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's really uh, the revelations that people will have from these materials uh, will, I, I think, just open up a new chapter of historiography of the Jewish people of Eastern Europe. Yeah, yeah uh, and um, one thing, Jonathan, that you always mention is that we are hoping to debunk stereotypes with the exhibitions of the museum. Yeah, um, and just just the fact that uh, the connection to Suchkova Such and uh, the fact that in three weeks' time it's uh, the 75th anniversary of the Nuremberg trials, and of course he was the only one that testified as a survivor in the Nuremberg trial. So just all those connections are amazing. Yes. Uh, um, and Michael, maybe the final word is for you. And Jean is really asking, if you had to use few words to describe your mom and, uh, and, and uh, you know, your, your memories of her, 
what will those words be? Uh, probably not possible to, to do it in a few words. Uh, you know, she was, um, she was passionate. She, she, she was damaged. Uh, you know, she, she had fears that she never overcame. Um, um, but she was a loving person. She was, she was, um, sophisticated and literate, um, loved, you know, loved her, uh, Tolstoy and, and her Pushkin especially, um, and, you know, wanted to transmit the, the heritage of her beloved Vilna to her children. You know, the, and she and my, my dad were together for 65 years. So, you know, um, yeah, we, you know, I don't know. It, it's an impossible task really to kind of convey her in a few words. She was a, she was a complicated, um, um, deep woman. And we invite you all to, to know her a bit better through exploring the exhibition and uh, looking at the many, many videos that are embedded in the exhibition from her testimonies to the Los Angeles uh, Testimonies Project and uh, just learning more about, about this life, this city, uh, this period. And uh, just to thank so much, uh, Jonathan Brand, Carolina uh, Zuliski, and Michael Leventhal. I'm now a bit tired, it's late night. So <laughs> forgive me, Carolina. It's but thank fine, you so fine. much. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Very thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, absolutely. You. And uh, someone is asking, it was recorded. The recording will be available in a few days and will be sent to you if you registered to, uh, to this uh, webinar. You will get a recording. You will get again uh, the link to the website and uh, you will be able to watch this webinar again and explore the, uh, the links again. So with that, um, Jonathan, Carolina, Michael, thank you so much. Thank you to the EVO uh, Institute, to uh, the team at the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center, and to all of you for joining us. And please, uh, please know that we have weekly webinars. And for example, on Thursday, we have a, a webinar about Poland this time. And uh, it is by Professor o uh, Anna Maria Ola Bukowska from the Agelonian University. It's at seven o'clock South African time. Uh, and it is called A Turn to the Right, Holocaust and Minority Issues in Con Contemporary Poland. So a little bit of a different outlook of where memory in Poland is uh, standing these days. And many more webinars coming. Uh, and, uh, and please join us if you are interested in Lithuania on the 3rd of November, we are celebrating the anniversary of the Vilna Gaon with Ivo Vilnius and uh, with many, many friends at, uh, with the Embassy of Lithuania in South Africa. Join us, good night, good morning, good afternoon. Hope to see you all again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, bye. Bye-bye, thank you.